Uh, it's going to focus on multi-platform, cross-platform, transmedia, whatever you call it. Everyone is jumping on the brand extension bandwagon, yet making extensions should only be done when and where it makes sense. Um, we've got a great group up here, uh, very knowledgeable folks. and. Um, before we kick off the panel, I just want to remind everybody to turn your cell phone, mobile phones to silent or turn them off, please. And I just have the pleasure of introducing Angela Heck, who I've known for many years in many of her different uh, iterations, going back to the National Film Board, CBC, uh, as well as uh, an industry, the industry programmer at uh, the Whistler Film Festival. Angela now works is back in Winnipeg and working at Tactica Interactive as their business development person. So I will turn it over to her as moderator of this panel. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. So uh, I'm really glad to see so many people in the room, considering we're going head to head with private capital. But uh, if we do our <laughs> job correctly here, you will come away with some really fabulous ideas for how you can uh, make some hay in this great, brave new world. I'm a prairie girl, what can I say? Uh, I would like to introduce uh, the panelists here, immediately to my left, to your right, is Mark Bishop, who's the uh, co-CEO and executive producer of Marvel Media. Uh, Caitlin O'Donovan is the director of digital products for Chorus Entertainment. And Victoria Evans is a uh, independent consultant and producer and also instructor at uh, Centennial College in the Interactive Digital Media Postgraduate Program. And Alan Sawyer is an, award, an Emmy award-winning content creator and producer, and he's also the founder and executive producer at Changing Channels Entertainment and the founder of Two Solitudes Consulting. Now, uh, they have promised me a very spirited panel, full of controversy, a little bit controversy. like taming the Kardashians up here, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> or not. We'll see how that works. Um, at, uh, I just wanted to say, um, Listening to the keynote this morning was really quite interesting. I love the word omnichannel. I think that's great. Um, but it's also a, a question of how do we frame this discussion. So I really wanted to start there with what do we mean by brand extension in the context of this panel? Are we talking about extending narrative? Are we looking at this as marketing and promotion? Or is there a, a combination of both? So, um, Mark, would you like to? Tackle that. I'll, uh, just to kick it off, I mean, I think what's interesting about even talking about the title of this panel and talking about, you know, a second screen is the word, of course, people are using now, brand extensions. Um, you know, I think for us um, at Marble and as, as storytellers, it's really about telling stories on multiple platforms. Uh, and the idea of having a primary and secondary screen, I think, is actually somewhat confusing. Um, and I don't think it's actually best for the storytelling. So I think we, we have to kind of take a step back, approach it from a storytelling uh, perspective. And, and again, the idea of, of, of transmedia is really taking advantage of telling stories on all of those uh, other platforms and taking advantage of what each of those platforms has to offer. Uh, so we're really not talking about interactive, if you will, as, as a pure marketing play. We're actually talking about it as another opportunity to tell stories and ultimately to connect with audiences. We had a, a pre-call before this panel and uh, Caitlin brought up a really interesting point about where the brand lives and it may not necessarily be TV. Yeah, you know, it's in the, the context of brand extension, right? Mm -hmm. And where it is, it, it presupposes that it's always going to start on TV and then go to all these other platforms. And especially in children's entertainment where in the preschool market you have, it might start as a consumer product, maybe it's a toy. And whether you're a My Little Pony or a Beyblade, um, actually the goal of TV is to help drive toy sales. And it, it, it's a, you know, consider it more an ecosystem. You have to make sure that all those points, specifically your TV, your consumer products, your digital, um, your, you know, all of those pieces are working together to make the audience awareness bigger and you're driving revenue on all of those fronts. And uh, to which you, you kind of would jokingly say, I've whoop, taken a personal commitment to stop um, defining transmedia and cross-platform, um, both in conversation um, with my company and with other people, because it drives me nuts. <laughs> um, in that, uh, if you don't believe in digital at this point, um, then you know that's fine. You obviously have other business models that work for you. But we also, as independent, um, independent interactive producers, need to start anchoring uh, what we're doing in terms of the overall business goals. So really, cross-platform or digital extension or um, yeah, transmedia, whatever you want to call it, 360, is all about 
um, what are the goals of this overall brand, right? How are we going to drive uh, viewership on television? How are we going to drive toy sales? How are we driving incremental new streams of revenue? And maybe that's um, as apps, as a, you know, a merchandise digital product, uh, or is it in some other crazy way on YouTube? I, again, it doesn't matter when you're looking at what are the goals of the overall property. There's my two cents. Do you have any uh, comments on that as well? You asking me? Sure. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, just very briefly, uh, if you can see Mark's sock, or socks, one's on display. <laughs> I, I think it's an interesting representation of, of what we're talking about. <laughs> I'm so curious to hear how you're going to bring this around. <laughs> well, because there are about six different colors in your sock. Uh, I, I haven't counted, but it's about yeah. six. They are. But they're all e evenly distributed. They are. I didn't create the socks. I wasn't suggesting he okay. needed his own socks. But, but if he did, more power to him. Now, some cross media, transmedia, whatever you want to call them, uh, properties take the approach where every platform is fundamentally equal. It may not play you know, as big a role as some of the others, but none of the platforms are particularly subservient to everything else. Contrary to that is the model that we see frequently in film and television where the film property or the television property is really the tent pole and everything else on the other platforms is really just there in support of that bigger initiative. And you really have to think of it in those two different ways of what type of property you're trying to do. And if you're a film and television producer, you, you still really want to be thinking about that tent pole property and bringing traffic to that TV show or that film. Uh, as the main driver, and you can spin off and, and sell merchandise on some of these other platforms, but first and foremost is making sure that tentpole platform succeeds. If you're doing Mark Socks, that approach, you've got a real challenge, and typically projects like that find limited audiences and have a real hard time succeeding. People will argue with me on that, and I'd love to hear some arguments against that. Um, but that's my initial thought about it, is just the point that there really are those two completely different models with different risks and different returns and so forth. I don't to argue with that a bit. Um, or to build on it is that, it. you know, <laughs> tea, uh, the throwdown happens. Um, I'd even argue that it's, it's even harder to say that it's only two camps, right? Because as the keynote this morning said, TV's changing so quickly. And if you look at how Nickelodeon is making Dora now, right? So instead of making your 13 episodes, 26 episodes, one season, all the other kind of extensions or product spin-off is they're now um, scripting. So the, the process of doing TV has changed in that they're now doing them in these three episode arcs. So they can stand alone or they can be bundled on the air for, uh, as a stunt event. So you don't have a season anymore. Basically, you're commissioning five stunt events. And a lot of that's driven by the over-the-top, the, top, the um, iTunes, you know, electronic sell-through, right? So the, as those models solidify and real revenue can be forecasted there, um, there's, I think, more opportunity on the digital side to connect with those. So we're not just saying, hey, it's Dora as a brand, or hey, it's Max and Ruby, or um, Eva Reality Show. It's, it's really, how are we supporting these um, bursts of activity and, and story worlds that the networks and shows are putting up? Mm -hmm. I think that um, to tie in what everyone's saying here, you know, this, this whole topic is about brand extension. And as, as I was saying to you the other day, when we emphasize that word extension, that means the brand has an identity we have to respect that the creators have already uh, established you know, what are the brand's uh, goals and their definition of how can that brand succeed. And coming from an inter independent uh, producer's perspective, um, it's not always, uh, it's not an us versus them conversation like, like Caitlin was saying. It, you know, the, the two camps aren't really so divided anymore. It's very much a collaborative effort where we have to sit down and really understand, okay, if this is your brand, whether that be a TV property or even a product, like we've dealt with uh, actual products, whether that be like a Red Bull or something like that, where they have an identity, they have a persona, they have a message that they want their community to be engaged with, and we have to decide, okay, is, are these platforms relevant to your brand's uh, conversation because you know if we're going to talk about multi-platform it's like people tend to make the mistake of saying we just have to be on all platforms because we we need to spread ourselves but it's like well is your audience there are they naturally engaged in the space whether that be the kids space or an older audience space it's like are you building this brand in a relevant way are you are you building your strategy in a way that your community can relate to because otherwise 
if it's too distributed, people get people get sort of overwhelmed and it dilutes the message of your, your brand. So it really does come back to knowing your audience. Absolutely. So yeah. too. I'd just like to add one thing to that too. And uh, Victoria talked about brand extension, so extending an existing brand. Yes. But when you're doing film and television, you're often dealing with a brand new brand, mm -hmm. but at the same time, anticipating success, which of course you're always anticipating when you're launching something, you don't launch it expecting it to fail. You've got to therefore prepare uh, your strategy across multiple platforms, so your brand extensions may be extending a brand new, unheard of brand, or a well-known brand. Mm -hmm and the strategy you have to take for those two different approaches can be quite different. Mm -hmm. But again, I think the word that you said there twice, Alan, that Teresa says, well, again, it's the idea of strategy and actually developing an aggressive brand strategy and how that's going to roll out on each of the different platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, again, and it's not enough to say we're developing a TV show and, oh, yeah, by the way, the CMF says we need to have a website, so we better better tag that on and let's go get, get those people to do it. It's about, yeah, it's from the very inception of an idea, developing a strategy of how the audience is going to engage in the content on all the platforms and what that rollout is going to be. And there can be a natural evolution of that. Uh, there should be a natural evolution. There has to be a multi-phased approach to the content, which again changes the way that, that we think about storytelling, which again gets back to what I said before about actually having something different on, on each of the platforms. It's important to have that evolution because it's not, again, the, the, the opportunity that we have with all these digital platforms is that the audience wants to keep engaging and keep experiencing the content. That also means that we as content creators have to keep giving them something on this platform. That has to be part of our strategy. That has to be part of our, our brand evolution uh, that we have to involve the audience in. So yeah. let's make yep. this a little bit more concrete, too. Uh, are there platforms, are there genres, are there formats that work well or not so well for different and or demographics. Or demographics. demographics uh, somebody brought up Grey's Anatomy. So, you know, when I think about um, how we break down uh, demographics, and it's not even demographics so much as consumption types. So you have the, what I call entertainment, that is uh, episodic. So these are the uh, Game of Thrones, right? Uh, you really want to consume it all very quickly. It's a, it's a big deal on TV. If it was all on Netflix, like House of Cards, people are going to assume it 1 to 13 immediately. Um, then you have kind of the non-episodic TV. A lot of the preschooler kid stuff is in that group. So more replay value. Um, there's a, a different way of consuming it, so it doesn't. It's not event-based TV, basically. And then the third would be the kind of news, sports, reality, game show. So that very quick. And they they obviously have um, different opportunities across the board in terms of those types of experiences. With reality, the the sports news ones are, are such an easy one. For, like there's so many great examples. Spike TV just has a new MMA app. If no one's checked it, it's really cool. And then on the episodic side. Um, there's a lot of uh, technology that's helping facilitate that. Grey's Anatomy was one of the first. Um, Sons of Anarchy has another app out. And that's de dealing with um, audio watermarking. So it bakes right into that uh, video master cues that will um, kind of uh, spring up content on, a, on an app when the audience is watching it. Um, but there's a lot of learnings that are happening. And one of the is Grey's Anatomy, which was one of the first kind of robust second screen apps to come out. And it's had a lot of great stuff in there, but it's generally considered a failure because it was too um, invasive, right? You're, you're watching your TV show. It's interrupting my flow by having all of these, like, check out more about the character. What happened behind the scenes? Or, like, it's this constant um, popcorning of stuff in front of you. Um, whereas uh, Sons of Anarchy have done a bit more, a different approach, but I'd say even the challenges there have been taking a lot of kind of website design 2003 style, which is like these really creative, look beautiful, but these experiential navs where you're moving through rooms and trying to find things are actually counterproductive to what people really want to do um, in that experience. That's a very long answer. If I can just add to that, though, I mean, I think what's interesting, though, is because I think traditionally people have said, especially for scripted drama, well, there's no point in, in, in doing interactive. And, uh, because of the challenge, of course, that audiences want to actually have a lean back experience of, of, of watching. But the interesting thing that, that we've started to see now on the sales side is that in particular when shows are into second and third run, um, what, what uh, people are interested in is what is that new experience? How can you take that content that, uh, you know, perhaps you've already watched that episode of Grey's Anatomy, but what, what can the new second screen uh, application be so that well, like you're watching that same episode you've seen before. Now it's an entirely new experience because of what you've been able to, to add on the interactive side. So I think uh, the, the, the interactive layer, if you will, actually does, it does create all new opportunities for sales of, of, of content uh, in second, third, fourth run. 
and, I mean, to give a concrete example around that is if you were launching, let's say, a show in uh, the US on Netflix, right? This is something that had done well, but you know, it's at that library stage. Imagine the, the PR and buzz and potentially a higher license fee you could get from Netflix if you were to create a second screen app specifically around it. So that's it. I also want to say that, you know, we're talking a lot of what would it, what, from the perspective of the television side. And I think, you know, it's also understanding why should these other platforms uh, be triggered. Um, so, you know, whether that be second screen or your mobile app, whatever that second screen is. But it's understanding that most of this, it's through social channels. And so you have to understand what am I, what, how am I socializing um, in this community? And I know that a lot of the discussion recently was just, you know, as, a, as your audience, they're annoyed when you're telling them um, known things that can be found on, the, on a regular website, like TV guide information, like, you know, okay, I know that there's another show coming up on CBC or another one coming up on Teletoon. I don't need that information. I need to know that if I'm going to socialize with you, whether that's through Twitter or Facebook, you are recognizing that I am an individual who um, is tuning into this show and the, the conversation of this show. So it's really like, it's understanding that if you're going to choose to socialize as your second screen option, uh, that socialization has to make sense. It has to, it has to be um, tied to the, the story that they're being exposed to. And it shouldn't just be, uh, you know, uh, bombarding them with ads or information that really has nothing to do with what they're watching. And that, that kind of engagement that happens, you're actually losing loyalty in, in your audience. You know, they wouldn't, if they don't like that, they're not going to come back again. And it's all this effort to think, oh, but we're socializing now. We're on Twitter, and now we're on Pinterest. And, and I'm amazed how many people talk to me about how they want to be on Pinterest. And I'm saying, well, is your property anything to do with like visual graphics? Or you know, what is Pinterest, right? It's the whole idea of like that scrapbook, scrapbooking and the visual. And you know, certain formats do lend better to that, and others don't, right? Which is why I said to you on Monday, like, I think, unfortunately, the it's not, I don't know if it's unfortunate or fortunate, but lifestyle reality type formats do well because people want to see. They want to see the before and the after. They want to see the results. That's why something like Pinterest could work. You know, it's like, oh, this is where I move the needle. It's the, 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 the opportunity to, to brag to your friends, the opportunity to personalize your uh, loyalty to this brand um, and, and show it off to your community, to your uh, friends and circle is what people want to do when they socialize. They don't want to just say, "Yay, I, I thumbs up," you know, your program. That means nothing. You know, the whole liking, thumbs up side of things doesn't really help you or help them. So, I think you have to be really careful though. What I'm going to say about about <coughs> just that. You know, we we call it in, the, in our office. We call it the buzzword bingo. Right, yeah. where you go into a broadcaster and they say, what's your Pinterest strategy? <laughs> they say, well, this is a preschool series. Why do we need to have, well, <laughs> well you know, Pinterest is the big thing. Everyone's doing it. It's like, well, OK, well, fine. We'll come up with our Pinterest strategy. <laughs> you know, and next week, there'll be, be a new one. And so I think we have to be careful. Uh, and as much as we love all these platforms, we have to be really careful to look at what the, you know, who the audience is, yep. what platforms they're, they're engaging on. It's going to change. Absolutely, it's going to change. And that's why, again, it's part of a strategy and it's part of an evolution. Um, but I do think we have to be careful not to make sure we're trying to just throw everything at the wall on every single platform and ensure that, that we're there just so we can put out a press release that, that says we have a YouTube channel and we have this channel and we have this and we have this and we've launched on all these platforms. We have to be really careful because we can spread ourselves too thin and, and try and, and be a little bit of something to everybody. Um, and, and the reality is it's a lot of work and for not a lot of reward. Absolutely. We had uh, talked about the straddling of um, the marketing promotion realm where if you're trying to engage in a social strategy, as Victoria mentioned, that also helps develop your audience and brings more eyeballs to your, your property. Um, Caitlin, you had mentioned there's the, the sort of the challenge between um, push to monetize content versus marketing. Absolutely. I think that's a lot of tension that digital producers feel when they're talking to broadcasters or even talking within their own organization around, okay, how much of our budget are we going to direct first to digital overall? Um, or, you know, when you're making the case for that uh, initial investment, um, what's the split then going to be between marketing support assets? So that would maybe be a website for a broadcaster that might be a flash game to go on their site. Um, maybe it's a Facebook campaign. Um, versus things that will, frankly, have any chance of making money. And really, we're looking at apps. 
right? There are some other models that Anumar can take you in terms of um, traffic, but in general, apps are one of the few ways we have of really driving incremental revenue that's, that's not ad-driven. Um, and in Canada, that's a real concern. So, uh, you know, and there's all sorts of different issues associated with trying to monetize apps appropriately, but, you know, if you've committed to going down the app route, then you're now meeting with, um, at the broadcaster level, you're meeting with all sorts of different departments that have different goals for your product. So maybe marketing will say, well, we want it to be free because we want everyone in the country to be able to access it. Um, sales will say, we want to be able to put ads in it. Um, you know, yourself, who wants to actually try to generate any revenue for your rev share agreement, wants to make sure that it's actually the best product that will either have a chance of, you know, converting people to paid users if there's an app or something. So you're walking and you're beginning the conversation from a very fractured standpoint and knowing the goals of your, again, the property, knowing your goals and what you're willing, you're, you're going to stand firm on not doing is very key to having some product that isn't, you know, designed by committee. <laughs> Plus it varies, uh, it, honestly it varies department to department, you know, the sales and marketing people will have a very uh, different idea of what is success versus the content side, the programming side. So as a producer it's important that you, uh, you request that, you know, all the people who are going to be ultimately uh, the ones who are going to uh, approve, you know, the layers that you're going to be creating, you know, on ter in terms of have we met the goals, have we, have we achieved what you've, we've set out to do, you should ask to have them present at your, you know, your initial meetings. I think we all know that because it, until you sit down and hear everyone's understanding of what we're striving to do, you're not putting yourself in a position where you're only pleasing marketing and sales. You're also taking in consideration what, you know, the writing department's done for several seasons. It's like, oh, you know, there's all this depth to how the characters have developed. What can we do with that? Is there anything we could do, uh, you know, to reward our audience with the, all this work that's already been thought about? You know, so you, they, they appreciate that. And you're not just coming in just trying to promote the show, but you're really trying to respect that the show is, uh, has sto story arcs and the show really has an identity that you want to you want to take care of on, in your platforms. To argue with that a bit, is there's also the cases where you're going to walk in and say, look, there's nothing here, frankly, that'll work. <laughs> just monetize. <laughs> like I can't, like, I can't do anything with this. So one example, I won't but that's too many it. examples on my side. So what we've done when we go in um, to that group, it's, and it's hard to do that. Not effective pitch because you're saying, look, we got our funding from somebody else. We're not going to actually work with you guys, even though you're the content originators and you're doing the TV. And there's these Bibles and things or, or you know images on what's happening. Is they're saying um, so we have one series that's just starting season two, and given what we've been seeing on season one, we're like, yeah, and we're we're not replicating that. It did not fly. So we're focusing on one character. It's a ninja, right? We know in the app space ninjas do well. So we're focusing on the little girl and the ninja. That's not the plan. Everyone's like, but that's a secondary character. You're not free. Forget it. The goal of the app is to make money. We're going to make sure that the flash games and the website updates all have nice, um, full property explanations. But the app is around selling that great art and that that um, kernel of a concept and making money. Yeah, and that's it's really important. You know, all these different stakeholders that you mentioned have opinions and desires and needs. But ultimately, generally, one person is controlling the budget that's actually going to pay for this. And knowing who that is is very important, too, because yes. you can spend a lot of time running around in circles trying Absolutely. to make everybody happy exactly. and then yeah. find out at the end, well, no, all the money's coming from me, and this is what I want, and screw that. Well, and that's what you often find. I mean, again, to, to Victoria's point, I mean, I think it, it actually behooves us. I mean, part of our, our model has actually been to go to the broadcaster and actually have separate meetings with each of the different departments. So we pitch programming. At 9 o'clock in the morning, I'll book an 11.30 meeting with the sales team, and I'll go see Interactive at 2. I won't tell any of them that I'm talking to the other team, um, but I actually go and, and have separate meetings. And it's quite strategic, because again, it's trying to find the champion for the project within each of those different departments. Uh, eventually, they're going to find out that they, they, they've all heard the pitch, but you know what? They've also heard a slightly different pitch, because the pitch that I make to programming, I never talk about revenue models. Holy crap, I wouldn't even mention it. Um, but then, of course, when we go and talk in, into sales, I've talked about all the points of integration that you can do on all the different platforms, I've talked to, to communications about what, what the release strategy is going to be, uh, and, and then connect the dots. And then what, what you find is you have a really engaged base of people um, who, who want to move forward and are all invested in, in the project from multiple points. Because I've been in those meetings, and in fact I was at one 
at a broadcaster who will remain nameless. And it, it, it gets, last week, it gets very tense because all of a sudden you have programming, interactive and sales, and it's like this tug of war starts going on, right? Because programming feels it's their content, um, you know, and sales feels, well, that's great monetization opportunity if we could just influence it here. And then interactive is kind of influenced because interactive kind of sits under the marketing group, so it's kind of over there. Uh, so it, it does become a bit of a tug of war. To Alan's point, the ultimate thing is, what do I need from the broadcast? Well, I need money. So who controls that money? You know, nine times out of ten, even if it's interactive, it's still the television department, so I've got to make sure I can get that money. But then ultimately, I need champions, right? You need to have champions in each of, of these other departments. So I need to figure out what their goals are. So what's the interactive goal? Well, it's to increase traffic and make revenue off apps. Okay, check, I'll make sure we, we do that. What's the, the goals at, at, you know, the sales department? They need to increase co-viewing. They need to have adults watching, even though it's a kid's network. Fine, we'll do that. We'll, we'll ensure that we hit that and bake that into the show. So the more we can talk to each of the different departments and understand their needs, the easier the whole process becomes. Now, one thing we've really focused on here is TV and the broadcaster. And at the risk of, um, you know, heresy, uh, do we still need the broadcaster? Are there examples? What are we talking about? Oh, Sorry, Caitlin. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about in terms of creating content on different platforms? And I'm um, devil's advocate. I still love broadcasters. <laughs> Uh, but uh, when we're talking about apps or uh, creating our own YouTube channels and generating advertising, you're playing at a different scale perhaps, but you're still able to play. I just want to say, I think you need audience. First of all, you need to grow audience and you need to bring audience to your content. And I'll just say off the top before we throw all the broadcasters under the bus, I know <laughs> there are a couple in this room, uh, you know, for launching a new brand, a broadcast brand can bring audience. So whether you're launching a broadcast brand that happens to be a YouTube channel, a broadcast brand on VOD, or a broadcast brand on a television screen, it does bring inherent audience and exposure to your new content. So that's where, again, I think there is, is still great value. I think it helps, I mean, ultimately it helps for the, the, the buy-in. I mean, it's nice when we have funds like the IPF, like the Bell Fund, like CMF's experimental fund, and it's really for that reason, experimental, to show that you can harness a community, you can harness the audience online based on your topic, based on your story. And you know, a lot of these funders want to see these little kernels succeed, that you have, you have, you have brought this sort of grassroots community forward to be a mainstream conversation. And, and of course, naturally, if, if you get the attention of the broadcaster and say, hey, that is something that is part of our mandate. That is that is our uh, reach too. We we want to be involved in your next season. That would be, you know, that would be a utopia. <laughs> you know, that's what I, I mean. At the end of the day, as producers, we want audience. We want to make more content. And and Mark's right. The the television power is that you can have that that broad reach. But it, it does happen. I mean, it's happening now, and that's why Canada, in a way is doing so well in the cross-platform space because we have opportunities that allows us to invest in the initial uh, pilot series or the initial you know, um, development of these, of these ideas and that you're not always um, at the broadcaster's mercy. You're not always at that gate which you know, you're competing against the same 20, most of the people already at this <laughs> conference, the same 20 people who are doing great work, compelling work, and it's like, well, how do I compete with them um, if I don't have the same track record, well, then I have this opportunity here to show that I, I can bring a, a similar following online. I think we're incredibly lucky for that in, in Canada in terms of the uh, support that, that we have. When you look at all of the, the, the financial support, and again, the more we travel and work with international partners. On the cross-platform side, I mean, to your point, Victoria, Canada is the envy. You look at the fact that, that you know, we, we've had a Bell Fund, which is a fund dedicated to interactive corresponding with, with television that's been around for 14 years. Uh, 16, but it's counting. 16 years, right? I mean, back when we were making websites, you had to have a dial-up modem to actually dial in and, and download this crap. Like, it, it, it's unheard of, that, that, but again, that's helped to really bake an industry into this country and, and actually to not only develop the industry, but change our way of thinking. And it is the envy of all of our partners. So we have great skills, we have great, great financial resources to, to do all this. And if you look at all the funds, whether it's the CMF, uh, the Shaw Rocket Fund that, uh, that has a digital stream, and you have all, all of these funds, um, IPF, OMBC, uh, all, all of these great partners. The challenge with all of it, though, I'll still bring it back to the point that 
uh, you know, 90% of all of these funds are still interactive innovation funds triggered by a broadcast license. Yeah. So we, the broadcaster is still at the at the core. They are still the ones that open the open the door to this innovation, and so they are still, um, from that perspective, uh, essential to the equation. Unless it's experimental fund. Perhaps. Unless it's experimental fund, that would be the one exception. Yeah. What's your sell through like on the interactive content when you make foreign sales of the television program? It's twofold. I mean, for us, we, we repackage the interactive content. Uh, and in some cases, we, we actually sell the interactive assets to countries where we haven't sold the show, uh, which has been great. I and mean, we're still selling Daniel Cook Games, which is, is a show that we did back in 2004, in countries where we didn't sell the, the TV program because it had to be dubbed, but because the interactive was actually created in such a way that it was game based. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to do that, and in fact, now we're actually reversioning those games and you know developing an iPad app. And because we own all those assets, we control the distribution. We own the distribution company, so we can do all of that. So, and that's what I said. Like, I think you, your company is the exception. Right? Yeah. Like, it, it's and, very right. hard to do that, and and Marvel's right. done an excellent job. I think it. Um, putting those business models together and then putting the infrastructure behind them. So. Yeah, oh, no, and, and that's just it. Because again, it has to be about developing the international strategy. I mean, Canada is our is our springboard, is our opportunity, is our sandbox to play and make really great things. Um, but there has to be a business opportunity attached to that. Yeah. So it's really developing great stuff, but developing it for the international marketplace. You know, and, and I mean, to, to your question, I think, Alan. I mean, sometimes it is the add-on. It is the you know. A, a senior exec at uh, a big American network said to me last week, they said, we have a pile of really great shows that we want to buy that have an interactive component, and we have a pile of really great shows that we want to buy that don't. And I can tell you right now from our mandate that we've been given from higher up, these are the shows that we're looking at. Right? So, yes, it may just be the icing on the cake, but that's actually what it's going to take because as much as there's been so much hype, it, we found, especially in the past six months, International broadcast groups have said, we need to see what your interactive strategy is. We need to see these assets. And those are the shows that we're going to consider. It's because the audiences have moved there. And it's also because the advertisers have told them this is what they have to do. So it's a wonderful thing, because now it's actually putting all of our linear TV content in the top of the pile, because we already have all of these interactive assets, where we can create these interactive assets in this great ecosystem that we have in Canada. Well, yeah, and you're mostly kids' content, but not exclusively. Do you see it? I'm, I'm not trying to moderate here. <laughs> do, you see, do you see the difference between the demographics, with the age groups there? I do, absolutely. I mean, with, with kids, it, it's a no-brainer. It has been, you know, since we started the company uh, 12 years ago. I mean, kids' content, kids' interactive content travels well, it sells well, you can version it, it's evergreen. Um, you know, get a brand new audience every three years so we can keep selling this stuff over and over again. I love it. Um, it is tougher in the other platforms, absolutely. Um, but again, um, you know, like I said, I think what, what, what's interesting now, especially on the second screen side, that's where there, there, there's a lot more interest in what is the second screen app that corresponds with the new drama series. I mean, we're, we're developing one right now, a, a primetime drama series, uh, and that's part of the thinking of what's it going to look like um, after first run, right? Because there is a real sensitivity, even from the advertiser's perspective, about not wanting to, to take away during first run in terms of what's happening on that, that tablet. But what's it going to be like once that show go, goes into repeats? How do we engage the audience, and how do we engage the advertisers? So to go back to your question around um, broadcast versus um, the, the new channel, let's say YouTube, Netflix, Amazon, to just put it out there. And one thing I wanted to mention was that I really see them as complementary, right? Because really, when you look at what's the difference between Amazon and Netflix and, and YouTube versus um, a broadcast channels, it's really you know length of content. They have short form. They also have full length episodes, and as well as movies. And also, the programming decision isn't made through an aggregator. At this point, that will likely change. And so, you know, there's a lot of fantastic examples of uh, Monster High, Barbie's Life in the Dollhouse, um, Moshi Monster. So these are toys or video properties that are moving into the, the video space with shorts on YouTube. And uh, when you look at, Bar I think I added it up one day to be 350 million views for Barbie's Life in the Dollhouse. And that was just the official stuff, not the, the re-spun out that people had copied and done. So um, incredible, I mean, obviously it's an established brand, but you look at ones like Monster High or Moshi Monsters that are building from other platforms up, um, and, and they're being smart about it, right? They're not just making um, basically promotional clips, they're making shows, they're hiring real writers, they're investing in that type of content. So, uh, and the audiences are responding, right? So when you have this shift of um, the cool brands are there, they're, they're, it's, it's a much faster iteration cycle, um, you can see immediately what works and what doesn't and, and be nimble in how that's 
um, developed is I really see those platforms as being excellent um, prototyping, new IP platform. Um, let's get out there and try it and let's really see what works with audiences before you go down the, the piloting route and the investing you know, hundreds of thousands if not millions in a TV show. But do you see a model though that, that, that actually contemplates that idea of you know, something happening on broadcast and something happening on those other platforms, and like say YouTube or Netflix. Like, is is there a, a way down the road where we could actually see real cooperation beyond the prototype stage when it actually gets to roll in? Absolutely. I mean, you look at um, Video Game High School, which is a Freddie W product. If you guys haven't seen it yet, it's um, funded by Kickstarter, right? So it's fantastic in that you had a group of people who had an audience already on YouTube that said, we want to make this thing. Um, so instead of trying to fund it through a traditional mechanism, they put it up on Kickstarter and um, got you know several hundred thousand dollars worth of funding, made season one, put it up. Um, now it went for season two. Now, it would be a perfect example of saying, you know what, we're not going to have season. So season one has shown itself. There are now millions of people that are eagerly awaiting, and they actually fund it. They did Kickstarter for season two. So it's fully funded. So imagine now if that was put onto a, a real, you know, another mass market channel like television, and what would that overall impact be, especially when they're relying on um, integrated sponsorship as well as ads on YouTube to build that. So absolutely. Now, we mentioned earlier that we are in a really luxurious position in Canada because we do have access to funds through CMS, through Bell Fund. Are we, as producers, actually taking advantage of those in the best possible way? You should be. Al's <laughs> <laughs> um, shaking his head down. Well, I, I, don't, smart ones are. I, don't, I don't want I don't want to go on a rant. Uh, I'll go on a rant. Come on, rant, rant, rant. Audience wants it. No, I, I just think the simple answer is no, uh, because the Bell Fund, which has been around for 16 years, 16. was it ended? 16 years? 16, yep. <clears throat> the Bell Fund, you know, had things like it have done a great job of helping to create ancillary experiences to go along with television. Uh, the CMF and their mandate, which is sort of forcing additional digital content onto every TV show practically, and it's sort of shotgun marriage of the two worlds, uh, to me is a big mistake. It's, it's taking a limited pool of money. There's only so much money, capital out there to invest in content in Canada, and it's forcing it to be spread too thin. So where it could be done that in addition to getting great money from the Bell Fund, you could take your CMS money and do something really stupendous and it's even a word. Mm -hmm. Something really, really good. You, you've lost that opportunity to a degree because you've had to spread the money across so much other stuff where it may be inappropriate, uh, and it, it just inspires mediocrity instead of uh, inspiring excellence. Okay, I would opinion. say that I think there's a transit. I'm going to go out on the limb. I think there's a transition from the old guard new media companies to the new guard new media companies. And I think there are some, like Marvel, I would say that have made that jump regarding um, new distribution models, new partnerships. But I, you know, I mean, th there have been many companies that have, have <clears throat> built up excellent reputations just going to Bell Fund and going to, you know, previously before CMF. Um, those versions of funds and building up, you know, excellent, amazing content that was around support that were um, they had, you know, limited set of rights maybe around that. There was limited set of expectations around revenue and it was all around innovation. So exciting stuff, but not maybe not seen by a lot of people. And now it's switched to much more focus on, you know, delivery of results. Whether that's if you're CMF focused or, you know, definitely Bell Fund now. And I'd say that the the, the biggest thing that those funds have given us as a from a kind of independent production route is. Um, ability to negotiate. When you can walk into a conversation and say, look, I'm prepared or I, we think we have a good chance if we structure it this way, if we do this, or if we are involved in the TV development process in such a way, um, that's incredible. So when it, back to the keynote around what do you own and what do you bring to the table, that's a big one. And the second is um, for the smart companies, um, you know, it's, tra it's not just making it's not doing the service model, right? It's not just saying we're going to make we're going to make three different TV show extensions a year, and we're just going to keep spinning it out. Is it's focusing on making engines and other products. And I think you know I don't know if you've heard, but Zincro was recently bought by Toka Boca, which is the the, the top preschooler um, app company out there by far. They have 22 million downloads, and I think that's directly because Bell Fund funded Tickle Tap apps, right? That was the f we didn't fund that. Uh, oh, right. Their development of their own IP. I funded that. No, there was my. 
<laughs> support, but that, sorry, to broaden it a bit more then, uh, support of companies like Zincro, right, that could, so you can do your service model and then also come up with your own IP on this side. Um, and engines. I, I think Caitlin's right, I mean, when she's talking about the smart companies, I mean, I've been, I've been, <coughs> sorry, I've been fortunate and uh, to recently have uh, review applications for Bell Fund as well as for CMFs. I, again, specifically, I'm looking at the experimental side because I, that's what, where I was during a lot of their work. And even during the Canadian Screen Awards recently, we're looking at all the digital categories and looking at all the work. And the work that gets funded, it, the, the smart companies we're talking about are people who are not just making engines. They're not, you know, it, there's, there is the temptation of a lot of technical uh, coming into this space and just saying, oh, I get it, it's apps, or I get it, it's, the, it's this engine. But it comes back to storytelling, and it comes back to understanding your audience and, you know, uh, being able to sit on the side of looking at how um, these funders consider, you know, uh, quality stories, quality uh, investments, because uh, it is an investment not just on, on money side, but on their reputation, you know, that track record. Um, you're really looking at <coughs> legacy. You know, at, at the end of the day, you don't want to do one. You want to do many. <laughs> you want to do a series. You want to, you want to come back and say you've got the spin-off show. You know, like Daniel Cook has all these other, not Daniel Cook, but um, you know, this so is Daniel. Two, two like, question there then. So if, if the goal is legacy, then why wouldn't it be funding things like engines? Well, it is as well, as, as well. But it's, it's, you know, it is understanding the use of the technology and and the engines. But it's a, it's like why. How does this make the story better? How does this make the story robust enough, like you said, for the second run when it's not when it's not timed, you know, as a live premiere, or when it's being uh, distributed in another country? And you're, you know, like it's it's learning to tap into the technology in a way that it it, it isn't always about a real time reaction, and giving the producers the ability to market that product, not just in Canada or not just in one province, but to take it to Europe, to take it to the States and say this technology could trans transfer here. Because you don't want to be limited to, like, like, like Mark was saying, if they don't buy the show, they can take at least the apps that we've created and we can, we can adapt to the times. If it's now we need an iPad version, we'll make the iPad version. Like that, that, that foresight that's required, that ability to think strategically, again, one of the like bingo words of today, like st thinking strategically how this will benefit your show beyond just the first one, run, beyond um, just satisfying your funders this year. You, you know, your funders want to see that the money they invest in you is going to really be the, the fire that lights you to, to get into that second space. So in a way, it is training. I mean, I may, maybe I'm sort of the um, you know, Rosie's side of this, but it is training producers to, to think, and, and you said that, to negotiate how this can be a good long-term play, a good strategic and play. We've got a, a good example even within Tactica mm -hmm. in uh, that we did a mobile app for a, a preschool show called Tika Talk on APTN. And uh, the way that we did that is the fundamentals of the show actually teach uh, speech, uh, you know, how to pronounce uh, particular letters. So. We looked at that app and we thought, why not look at this from a speech therapy perspective? We brought in a speech therapy consultant and we actually used really strong uh, research and, and fundamentals to create an app that used the characters from the show, really bright, lively graphics, but had a really solid foundation in the science of speech therapy. What we found is that the app, uh, it sells for $4.99 at the uh, iTunes store, uh, because it's a bit of a specialty, but it's got a huge audience and continues to sell in the speech pathology community. So we've got all these sales in the US where the show doesn't even air, but it's extended the brand into a completely different realm that's been a really great spin. And we've got about 15 minutes left, so I just wanted to let you know that and open it up to questions at this point. I think that would be a great idea. Anybody have a question? Sorry. Of course, Andrew, here. hang on a second. <laughs> totally, yeah, totally. Now I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think we should be doing for feature films? They're a totally different beast from TV, I'd say. A film is a, a different world. It's not my world. I don't do any feature films. But it, from what I've seen in terms of um, life cycles and audience consumption and digital properties that go with them, it's, I'd say it's completely separate. But I would also say too, I mean, if we look at the feature film 
world and the feature film consumption. Um, I mean, yes, there's feature film for theatrical, but the reality is most of the feature films, Canadian feature films, or even feature films in general that, that we're consuming, we are consuming it on screens that we have in our house. So whether we're talking about consuming it on a tablet, whether we're talking about there may be a new television channel coming that will show all Canadian feature films. Um, you know, I think if you look at that, again, it's, to me, it's storytelling. Uh, it's, 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 again, giving us an opportunity uh, to have deeper engagement with the audience. I think the challenge, of course, is that it, they are one-offs, right? So it's no different than, you know, when we, we try and do an interactive component for a one-off TV special. Uh, it, they are very challenging. But again, I think what's interesting, to get back to some of the points that, that, that have been raised, I mean, again, if, if you can look at it from the perspective of developing, uh, whether it's synchronized applications or other games, uh, that have engines that can be repurposed so that you're not spending a half million dollars on an interactive for a feature film that once the feature film goes away, you're going to throw the interactive away. But you're really investing in something that has a solid uh, set of tools and applications that you can repurpose again. That you can acknowledge the fact that, that these films are evergreen and the interactive component can continue to, to live and grow and breathe um, because the film will be enjoyed many more times. Um, so I think by looking at it from those 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 two perspectives, you can um, can can justify the investment. I think it really also depends on what the nature of the film is. I don't know that I want to relive a Lars von Trier's on a second screen, you know. Um, but uh, if it can live as a separate entity and live on its own, say as an app or so, and there's value to that, um, then I mean there's many applications to look at. Well, also in feature films, it's so much about that opening weekend. Like it's the, you know their their determination of success is how you know what what are the ticket sales that weekend. So a lot of times, this is where the interactive is typically used for marketing and promotion. Is the really driving the hype, the audience to uh, want to see it that first weekend, not wait two months later, not wait for it to get on uh, on demand or Netflix. And so this is the side where you really need to harness your social your social media power and really have that fan loyalty uh, help you drive those the audience to ticket sales because that's a you're right it's a different it's a different beast and I think it may be another panel conversation and that is where social media too again the idea of social media we have to remember has to be part of that strategy that we talked about before it has to be part of the strategy it has to be part of your content deployment um, that social media is not just something that the marketing department does after the content's been released it's something that you very aggressively do the entire way leading up to, during, uh, after. Uh, it's a conversation, right? And, and I think that's where we have an opportunity to, to really engage with audiences and to, to release and give them something and also listen to audiences uh, during that lead up. But, but again, it has to be part of, of your strategy. It also depends, again, where the brand lies. I can tell you the Avengers, my five-year-old knows exactly which hero he is because of an app that he has, and he's never going to see the movie. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and that's working with extending existing characters. Yeah. But, and uh, unfortunately, that tends to be a real trend in movies these days, is to rehash old movies uh, or old characters. But still, I think the majority of movies are dealing with new, unknown characters, and it's really hard to get an excited conversation going about characters that nobody's ever heard of. So, But speaking of excited conversation, if you want to get one going, there is a hashtag on the screen. <laughs> Feel free to have the experience. Are there other I just noticed it over your head, so I had to plug it. Well done. <laughs> um, you've given some examples of... the mic really just for some Thanks. Hey. Um, you've given some examples of what doesn't work in terms of other apps and we've heard Grey's Anatomy and all that and I get the point about being strategic about using them. Can you give an example of some shows that have apps that you think really complements the content? One, one network based app, um, Cartoon Network's app. So Cartoon Network um, has had an app in market for a while uh, and um, ABC, Spark has one, it's, or ABC Family has one in the States. Uh, Nickelodeon just launched one last week, which is kind of top of mind. Everyone's looking at them again. So ABC uh, Family one is excellent because it aggregates all of the social activity into one space that you can interact with. So you're not going to all the different parts. It's been a great kind of second screening piece. So there's little tidbits of information that's pulled in from the web. Um, the uh, Cartoon Network one is fantastic, right? It, it, US, right, so it authenticates in with the BDUs, it's for full length episodes, there's clips, there's content, they have great interfaces, so depending on which way it's oriented, you get different types of content. The Nick one has just launched um, huge amounts of content, and they're a huge investment in HTML5 gaming. 
but um, the interface is weird, right? Like you're scrolling. But I like the Nickelodeon one because what's interesting about it is that they've said, let's put everything on one screen. So they've actually taken the tablet and they've actually divided it up. So in the top half, you actually have yeah. your, your video feed, uh, which again can be live stream, can be content on demand. The bottom half are your games. So what they've done is they've actually embedded all the games because, of course, the challenge is we build all these great in interactive games that end up sometimes sitting on a broadcaster set over here, and then television lives over here. And, and unless the broadcaster does a lower third to tell the audience, oh, by the way, go online, this is the URL, you, by the way, you can play the games, sometimes there's not that connection. So they've actually said, let's put the whole experience, acknowledging that kids are watching the video, watching our channel on a tablet. Let's just actually take it and split the screen. So well, it's a bit weird in its design, but the approach is let's actually put it there, let's tag the episodes, tag it directly to the games, so that you can actually play the games that are synchronized with the video content that you're watching. Um, so again, it's, it's com compacting it all um, and, and having an integrated experience. One of the challenges, though, with things like that is that if you do have a successful interactive property, you can't generally actually trace the traffic that goes back to the TV if somebody's watching on a conventional TV set, so an older audience, not necessarily older, but an audience that's watching on cable or satellite, there's no tie back to know who that person is and identify whether they ever went to the interactive experience or went, for example, to the interactive experience first and that created a new viewer of the TV show. Generally speaking, you can't at least you cannot easily trace that kind of stuff. It's very do you think that'll change? Right when you look at what Nielsen's doing in the states, right? With the what's it called the plus two, plus five yeah. rating. So basically, it's a way of looking at ratings instead of just coming through the the TV set. You're also able to pull it in through what they're watching um, on iTunes or web through different sources. So which is great because you just don't want to um, count the ratings from one device if you're mm -hmm. actively getting it out there. So my, I mean, the hope is that it'll start to be able to track or figure out, um, you know basically correlating users, but down the road. It's, it'll change a bit, but it's, a, it's a definitely a very interesting challenge yeah. to aggregate people's activities across unrelated suppliers. So my high-speed internet and my cable do not come from the same source. Mm -hmm. So if you want to aggregate my activity across those two, mm -hmm. you, you definitely need my cooperation to help you do that. Uh, and it'll take time, definitely, before they get very far with that, right. I think. I mean, but I'm the center. One example I gave was Walking Dead, right? And it's not a second screen app, but it's the one Telltale Games did it um, out of San Francisco. And it's one of the really good examples of um, exciting, innovative um, way of adding to a story on another on another kind of platform, if you will, even though it's on, you know, let's say, tablet and a PC. Mark, you talked earlier about uh, the value that a broadcaster still brings, uh, both in terms of its um, exposure for the program and also in terms of the funding. Uh, what do you see then as a way to work with the broadcaster and see that they get recognition for and value for that uh, support and for supporting your program? No, absolutely. I mean, again, we, we see the broadcaster as, as a key partner. Uh, and so I think it gets back to what I was saying about really, uh, you know, trying to define everyone's objectives. So trying to understand what the broadcast objectives are, whether they're sales targets, whether they're audience targets. Uh, I mean, ultimately, we need to continue to grow and build healthy businesses, healthy production companies, healthy broadcasters. That's the ecosystem that we need to have in this country. So to do that, everyone needs to continue to grow and everyone needs to, to, to help each other. Um, so you know, in, in making that happen, I think it's part of an ongoing conversation of saying, okay, what's, what's ultimately important to this broadcaster? And it's not the same for every broadcaster. So if, if, if it's increased traffic on the website, okay, then let's do that. How can we create a suite of really um, sticky games that we know are going to keep kids coming back so we can drive those numbers? If it's new opportunity for brand integration, because you can do it online, which you can't do in television, um, so we're doing that with, with, with one broadcaster right now, and that's one of their, their opportunities. Well, we're happy to do that because that's their target. So you know, in, in exchange for the investment uh, and the commitment that they're making to our series, uh, which allows us to go and get Bell Fund and, and CMF and everything else and build this robust experience and have something we can then take and monetize in, uh, internationally, how do we then say, OK, let's help them achieve their goal in Canada? Uh, by, by bringing an advertiser in and designing the interactive so that, that, that it can do that. So I think it's a matter of having a conversation and trying to understand the, the, what the broadcaster needs um, you know, and, and acknowledging that you know, together uh, producers and broadcasters can, can make uh, great revenue opportunities, can minimize the risk, 
Uh, you know, the broadcaster is getting 100% of a great content experience by only having to put in 25% uh, of, of the risk. That being said, that's the key 25%, because without that, you're not going get to get the uh, rest of, of, of that entire picture. Uh, so I think it is shared risk, shared reward. To follow on that, when I'm pitching broadcasters, so in Canada as well as uh, we work with Nick and Cartoon Network in the States, um, I pitch them two specific things. One is um, apps are the only way to make money. Basically, the only, not only, uh, one of the surefire ways of making money, have a chance at it. Um, and so it's a risk. So I say two different um, rev shares. One is uh, on initial investment. So if they come in, um, especially in Canada, we push this one, they come in for 10% or more of the funding, um, they get a percentage of revenue, obviously. And the second is um, promotion distribution. So if there's a commitment to on-air promotion of the show, um, and we nail them, try to nail it down in terms of specifically how many weeks or days and when and how, they'll get, um, it, it's roughly 15% of gross revenue. We've done another model, too, like that, where, where we work with the broadcasters. We actually agree to give away the app for a, a, a certain period of time. Because from our perspective, it's actually great promotion. So we'll give away the app for the first month. In exchange, the broadcaster can actually take and sell that as a premium to an advertiser for the on-air promotion. So we actually get a 30-second spot that, that actually is a complete promotion for our app brought to you by X brand. Um, so it's great exposure. Uh, the broadcaster can then go take and sell that, that spot fine, can, can, can generate new, new revenue and offer something that's a premium to an advertiser. Uh, and then what do we get? We get great, great exposure. Once that, that campaign ends, people know that there's this great iPad app. They'll continue to, to, to purchase because the awareness has been raised. Uh, and then moving forward, of course, the broadcaster in, in Canada does have a rev share um, to, to share it moving forward. But then they've now created a new model for a new premium way to be able to sell uh, some content. To answer your question a little bit too, um, and uh, it, this could be a very self-serving com comment too, but uh, what is interesting in this new world is that there is an interactive producer role that is gaining a lot of ground and a lot of strength. And there are so many questions to ask around all of this uh, that to bring an interactive producer onto your team if one doesn't already exist is a really valuable thing. Uh, Mark is a bit of an anomaly, not him personally, but his company, because they do everything uh, in-house. Uh, and more and more, I think, we'll start to see that whole 360 approach being taken in-house. Well, yeah, yes, as well. For a company like Mark, I mean, Mark obviously um, just pioneering in this space, but also recognizing a lot of broadcasters are doing it in-house as well. They're, they are beefing up their team to have um, the skill set, I mean, you would know this, uh, Caitlin, because you're coming from a broadcaster's perspective, but I'm seeing it, like going to CBC, going to Shaw, um, it's not just people who are just seeing if you've made the checklist. There are, uh, there are valuable conversations that's happening in-house, and there's uh, that knowledge base that's also happening. So as the interactive producer working with the broadcaster, um, it's great that your conversation isn't looking at it as a service model anymore, that you really are coming in as we were saying earlier, it's not an us versus them. We really are working together to um, really figure out how this extension works in, in all these platforms and, and um, where, what does the metrics tell you. At the end of the day, your research data is really going to uh, be apparent. It's going to be transparent to you about how you should be building and how your broadcaster should be reacting to all that data. And if there isn't that data, then we've got a whole other problem happening. Mm -hmm. So one to, to kind of counter that, and then, um, what I've seen on the broadcaster side, both in Canada and the U.S. too, is yes, there's definitely a beefing up of interactive departments, but it tends to be more on the content and strategy side. It's more on the, the interactive digital production side. So there is a very big opportunity to partner with all the people out there. You will get a lot more questions from people that have been around the industry longer to ask the tough ones. But um, you know, if you look at you know Shaw, what Shaw is doing, they're not they're not making their apps in house. That's no. all farmed out, right? Yeah. Same with us. So Chorus now we've split it. So um, my team was spun off as a separate company. Um, we do our stuff, but we operate like um, any other company. I have to lay off people if I don't get CMF funding for a project I've submitted. Everyone is on an hourly basis, right? So it's not, um, it, there's a, sometimes a, a misperception that um, you know broadcasters have a lot of um, money to throw at interactive, but I think there's a huge compression in terms of uh, actual cash dollars, and therefore I need to partner. Mm -hmm. and, and to find those people that are doing the unique things and, and do those, um, the deals. And I think we're going to have to wrap it up right there and we'll leave it on the, uh, the keyword of collaboration.
Great, I'd like to thank Ange and uh, Mark, Caitlin, Victoria and Alan for a really stimulating panel. Next up is in the ballroom lunch with uh, the MPAA and an announcement from Canadian Heritage. Thanks again. Thank you.